And we're going to read these uh, closing uh, verses of this chapter uh, where God gives the blessing uh, uh, to his people and he directs uh, it, that Aaron and his sons are to declare this blessing and to pronounce it upon uh, the people. And uh, as they do that, as they do that in tandem with the authority that they have received from God, God will, as we'll read in verse 27, put his name upon them and bless them. So we read from Numbers chapter 6, beginning at verse 22. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine uh, upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. Then we want to read about the first instance this was used. So we're going to look at Leviticus chapter 9. Leviticus chapter 9, uh, page 104. Leviticus chapter 9. Although we've turned back in our Bibles, we are actually going forward in chronological history here. Uh, we read, we're going to read here in this chapter of that um, worship service where it is uh, pronounced upon the people. Um, you pay attention to those uh, closing ver verses of uh, chapter uh, 22, or sorry, chapter 9, verse 22 onwards. That's where an Aaron uh, pronounces it but it's 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 really it's the climax of what's been happening at Sinai for uh, the the large part of a year by this stage as they've received the the law they've had the priesthood established they've had worship established they've had the tabernacle and um, designs given to them and built and now the people come and they worship and so we're going to read from the beginning of this chapter where Aaron and his sons offer the sacrifice for themselves and then the people of God. And then at the end of the worship service comes the Lord's blessing. So chapter 9 of Leviticus, beginning at verse 1. On the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel and said to Aaron, Take for yourselves yourself a bull, calf, for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering, both without blemish, and offer them before the Lord, and say to the people of Israel, Take a male goat for a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both a year old, without blemish, for a burnt offering, and an ox and a ram for a peace offering, to sacrifice before the Lord, and a grain offering mixed with oil, for today the Lord will appear to you. And they brought what Moses commanded in front of the tent of meeting, and all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. And Moses said, This is the thing that the Lord commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Then Moses said to Aaron, Draw near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering and make atonement for yourself and for the people and bring the offering of the people and make atonement for them as the Lord has commanded. So Aaron drew near to the altar and killed the calf of the sin offering which was for himself. And the sons of Aaron presented the blood to him and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the altar and poured out the blood at the base of the altar. But the fat and the kidneys and the long lobe of the liver from the sin offering he burned on the altar as the Lord commanded Moses. The flesh and the skin he burned up with fire outside the camp. Then he killed the burnt offering 
And the Aaron's sons handed him the blood and he threw it against the sides of the altar. And they handed the burnt offering to him piece by piece and the head and he burned them on the altar. And he washed the entrails and the legs and burned them with the burnt offering on the altar. Then he presented the people's offering and took the goat of the sin offering that was for the people and killed it and offered it as a sin offering like the first one. And he presented the burnt offering and he offered it according to the rule. And he presented the grain offering, took a handful of it and burned it on the altar beside the burnt offering of the morning. Then he killed the ox and the ram and, the, and the, the sacrifice of the peace offerings for the people. And Aaron's sons handed him the blood, and he threw it against the sides of the altar. But the fat pieces of the ox and of the ram, the fat tail uh, and that which covers the entrails and the kidneys and the long lobe of the liver. They put the fat pieces on the, bre uh, on the breast, and he burned the fat pieces on the altar. But the breast of the, and the right thigh Aaron waved for a wave offering before the Lord as Moses commanded. Then Aaron lifted up his hands towards the people and blessed him. And he came down from the offering, the burnt sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Amen. I don't know if any of us have been following the, uh, uh, the Rugby World Cup in the last days. Maybe you've lost a little bit of interest in it since Ireland were... Uh, put out uh, last uh, weekend, but I, I always I always enjoy uh, seeing that wee clip that you get during the halftime break of the coach uh, speaking to them in the dressing room, and there's no sign, but there's plenty of actions usually going on, and you're just wondering what is that coach saying there in those moments. Well, in the closing moments before players appear at a pitch. Typically, the coach or the, the captain of the team uh, seeks to give them a final word of encouragement, a final word of direction. They're about to depart, to be separated from their coach. He'll go to the stands to watch a game or to stand on the sidelines. And the team is about to go out and face the opposition. The task before the team is maybe daunting. They're the underdogs. Uh, their best players are perhaps injured. The opponents maybe even have the home advantage. But in those last moments, uh, the coach will give them a short, pithy, motivational speech. He'll seek to spare them on, to inspire them to victory. Well, this evening we want to come and we want to consider God's final word to us as we leave worship each week. We're going to think this evening about the, what's called the Aaronic Benediction or the Old Testament Benediction. We read of it earlier in Numbers 6 and it would be helpful for you to open up your Bibles there at Numbers chapter 6, page 137. The Benediction is most definitely not a motivational speech but it is God's last word to us before we separate from his special presence and we enter the world for the next week. Before we leave him and that special presence that we have with him through the gathering of the saints uh, visibly and physically together, he gives us a word to sustain us till we meet again in worship next Lord's day. And in those closing minutes, our seconds of worship, God is saying three things to us. 
He's committing to do three things for us. He's telling us, I will keep you. I will sustain you. And I will give you my peace. And so we want to briefly this evening uh, pause and look at each of these statements and consider what God is committing to and promising and assuring us of when we leave worship each uh, week. It's important just to pause here and note that these are statements that are said to the believer. It is only the believer that can know that God's uh, keeping hand and God's sustaining grace and God's special priest. These are things that God says to his people. And that's even clear from our passage. If you, uh, you look there at uh, verse 23, Aaron's told to speak these not to anybody, but he's told to say them to the people of Israel. God's special people in the Old Testament. It was the Old Testament church that these words were declared to. We see it again in verse 27. God says, so they shall put my name upon the people of Israel. In a sense, the benediction is a naming ceremony where God is writing his name on us once again, saying that you are mine. You are my people. And even that reminds us that that can't be anybody and everybody, but only those who have saving faith in Jesus Christ. Only those who have turned from their sins and living that life of rebellion against God and have placed their faith in the sacrifice for sin of Jesus Christ and are trusting and relying on him. And so for any who are here this evening who are outside of Christ, without saving faith, this isn't a word for you. You cannot know God keeping you. You cannot know God sustaining you. You cannot know God's peace upon you unless you are in Christ. But for each of us who are in Christ, these are wonderful promises, wonderful commitments that God gives to us. And so let's look at that first statement in uh, the benediction. A benediction being a word meaning a uh, good word, a uh, blessing, and so that's why it comes from the Latin and that's why it's used uh, or often referred to as that. But the first statement is, I will keep you. I will keep you. Verse 24, let's read it together. The Lord bless you and keep you. What does it mean to be blessed? You've probably heard people say, I'm blessed to have this person or this thing in my life or to have that experience. But to be blessed by God is to first and foremostly be in a favoured state with him. It's to be in right standing with him. These two words are a reminder of God's disposition towards us. It's one of favour. It's one of delight. It's one of great pleasure and rejoicing and gladdening in his people. God is reminding us in those very first words, the Lord bless you. He's reminding us of our new status with him. He's telling us about the relationship that we now have with him through Christ. We're no longer in that state of sin whereby we only know his disfavor and his hand against us. Now we know his hand upon us for good. We've been reconciled to him. We're no longer his enemy going our own direction, kicking against him. But we're now walking hand in hand with him as we follow his will. God telling us, the Lord bless you, reminds us of our new relationship with him. 
It tells us that no longer are we at arm's reach held from God. Instead, he's drawn us in. He's taken us under the shadow of our wing. Like the prodigal son in that parable of the New Testament. He's run out to meet us. He's embraced us. He's welcomed us into his house. And he's delighting in our presence there. But not only are we in a favoured state with God. His favour rests upon us. He looks upon us with great pleasure. We are his delight and we enjoy his approval. Imagine with me uh, a couple that are getting married. As the day approaches, the excitement and the anticipation builds in each one of them. And then all of a sudden on the day, it just explodes so it does. From the start of the day to the finish of the day, they are beaming with joy. I had a friend when I was going through uni and he, he talked about how uh, they, he had smiled so much during the service that he and his wife got into the car as they were going to the hotel and they had to massage their faces because their cheeks were so sore they'd been smiling so much as they went. And we can see it written over their faces, this joy that they have. Their eyes are dancing, their cheeks are raised. They have joy written all over their faces. And Isaiah tells us that that's God's disposition towards us now in Christ. Isaiah writes, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The very first words of this benediction supply us as believers uh, with an assurance that we are in God's favoured state. It tells us about how God feels uh, towards us. To be blessed by God is to be favoured by him. But this first statement doesn't end with the Lord bless you. That would be good enough. But this, uh, God goes on to say the Lord bless you and keep you. God's favour his delight in us is manifested in his preservation of his own people. In his keeping hand being around them. The Lord bless you and keep you. This word keep has all shades of meaning. It can mean that he watches over us just as a mother would watch their child as they scoot between the, the slide and the seesaw and then the swings and the climbing frame all at the park. It has the idea of keeping just as women keep and treasure maybe a special piece of jewellery that they have. It has the idea also of protection, like a soldier that goes out and protects their country. And so we are to get this idea and this picture of God paying careful attention to his people. He's watching them. He's keeping them. He's protecting them always. We sang of it in Psalm 121, didn't we? Of God's keeping hand. And we saw the, the detail of God's keeping. That it's throughout the whole of our lives. In every circumstance, God's hand is is keeping us. We sang of the comprehensive, round-the-clock care of God for each one of his people. This is a wonderful truth, isn't it? The Lord's watchful eye is always upon his own. There's never a time, there's never a circumstance where he's not keeping his people. And what a comfort that is for us. What a reassurance that should bring to us. Every situation we face as believers, the Lord is keeping us. He's watching us. He's protecting us. 
Every danger which threatens, the Lord promises to keep us. Every temptation that we battle through our lives, the Lord promises to keep keep us. Every attack that we come under from the evil one who seeks to tear us down and to pull us back into that pit of sin, the Lord promises to keep us. But there's something that we need to be careful about. The Lord's keeping of us doesn't mean that we'll have a cushioned life. It doesn't keep us from having trouble. It doesn't stop that illness coming into our lives. It doesn't mean that we'll not lose our job or that we'll um, have some difficulty in our family circumstances. But God's keeping hand means that we're well armed to face those circumstances. That the Lord will keep us through it. That he'll carry us through those dark valleys because he's there with us. It also has a spiritual significance. To be kept by God is to be secure in a state of grace. It means that we can never lose our salvation. We'll never fall out of the hand of God. God will preserve us till we reach heaven. And so for those of us who maybe struggle with assurance of faith, well, when we know the gospel and we've made that profession, we can be sure that God will keep us. He will preserve us. And so that means whether sin or trial or Satan, he can't take us from God. It means that we cannot lose our salvation. What God has started in us, he will bring to completion also. He intends to finish it and he has it planned out. As God says, the Lord bless you and keep you. This is God's commitment to preserve us till we reach his presence forever. And this is the last thing that God says to us before we go out into the world. His final word is that I am with you. I am your keeper. You're safe with me. He wants us to remember this as we face our week's work, as we go to that hospital appointment, as we traverse that family problem, he says, I'll keep you. I'm watching over you as you face it all. So the first statement that God says to us in his blessing is, I will keep you. But he goes on and he says, I will sustain you. And we're now looking at verse 25. And let's read it again to refresh our memories. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. I want you to imagine now a a father and his son. And for whatever reason, the father's face is beaming. It's bright, it's joyful, and he's smiling like a Cheshire cat. And it's all because of his son. As he looks, he has great joy and jubilance over him. There's nothing but delight and favour. And it's all towards this son that's maybe bounding towards him as he's arrived in from work. Or maybe a grandson for some of you as you, you go and visit and they go straight past grandma and they're straight to granddad and they are delighting in you. Maybe you've had it, you've maybe observed it, you've maybe shown it uh, to uh, someone. The father's face is beaming on his son. It's radiating like the rays of the sun and it has uh, that appealing draw for the son to come close to. That's God's disposition towards us. 
His face is beaming on us, his children. We read of it in Zephaniah and our call to worship. At 317, the Lord your God is in your midst. A mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quieten you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. In those moments when a parent's face beams on their child, favour comes. Favour is displayed uh, towards that uh, child. And that's the same with God to his people. Except the difference is we don't fall out of that favoured state. The child does something wrong maybe a couple of hours later and they know the disfavour and they maybe get uh, uh, disciplined because of it. Well, we are always in a favoured state with God because we're secured by Christ. The psalmist often appeals for God's face to shine upon him because he knows that as God's face shines upon him, he will know God's favour towards him. And we sang of that in Psalm 67. God bless and pity us, shine on us with your face. He needs um, the, the believer uh, wants uh, God to save him and to sustain him through whatever he faces. And so in the benediction, God is promising to do just that, to sustain us and to carry us through it. It's God's commitment to provide that needed grace to be sustained throughout um, whatever the hardship is, whatever we need to go through, whatever it is we face, God is Promising it to us. Do you ever look at what is ahead of you in the day? Maybe as you, when you go home in the evening after church, you remember having a bit of supper, even after you've had supper here, because you always have to have a cup of tea before you go to bed. And as you think about that, the mind starts churning about what's coming up tomorrow. What you're going to have to face at work in the next week, you maybe wonder yourself, how am I going to get through it? Maybe things seem hopeless at times. Or you think of the situation where you're, you're right in the thick of it and you can't see the light. You can't see the, the end of the tunnel. Well, remember, in both those circumstances... What God has said in his blessing as you've left church in the Lord's day. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. In these words God's telling us you're not alone. You don't have to do it on your own. He's promising to provide for you his sustaining grace to keep you and to carry you through that circumstance. God will equip you for whatever mountain you need to climb in, in this week. He'll enable you to traverse uh, whatever miry uh, trench you have to walk through this week of life. God's grace is sufficient. In our weakness, He is strong. In all you face, this is God's disposition towards you. He's gracious to you. As believers, God's face is shining on us. We're in his favoured place and we know his sustaining grace, that strength, that ability to be able to keep going because he enables us to do it. The benediction tells us I will keep you. I'll sustain you. And then finally it says, I will give you my peace. Don't we live in a world that longs for peace? How much more does the world think about those things 
And when a war has broken out, our two nations uh, are at lockerheads against each other. From the campaign for world peace by organizations to the, the parent who just wants five minutes at peace in the house. We all long for it. Yet despite the existence of organizations that seek to broker peace or nations that seek to come alongside those at war to bring peace. And although there's all sorts of self-help books and audios, podcasts, which try to help us find peace, it's as if peace is so unattainable for us. We're just as restless, fretful, and confrontational as ever. And that's often because man fails to recognize or acknowledge the cause of the lack of our peace. And they very often omit the key to peace. God is the key to peace. And peace with him, firstly, will then... uh, mean and follow through to peace in our lives. And that's what the uh, verse 26 tells us. Verse 26, the Lord turn his face towards you. That's what it means to lift up your countenance and give you peace. We can tell a lot from reading a person's facial expressions. Think of the child who in your presence crosses their arms, clenches their lips and has a real humpy look on their face. You don't need to be a mind reader to know that that child isn't too happy and if you're the only person in the room and this has all of a sudden happened, they're not very happy with you. And so what do we do as adults? Well, we we get down uh, beside them on our knees. We start to ask questions. We listen to the answers. And as you talk to the child, little by little, that screwed up face relaxes. The arms drop to the side and they begin to straighten up. And that hostile uh, posture all of a sudden dissipates away. And it ends with a hug and maybe the words, I love you. The two are reconciled, the two are at peace again. The conversation has unfolded to bring that about. And in scripture, a face being turned in a certain direction means certain things. A face being turned towards someone um, uh, often means that idea of reconciliation and Peace. If you think of Joseph, remember Joseph was in prison, and as he was in prison, he was given responsibility for uh, two uh, men. It wasn't the butcher and the baker; it was the the cupbearer and the and the baker. And as he looks after them, he realizes one day that their whole disposition is that they are not very happy and they're exercised by something. And so Joseph asks them the questions and they answer that uh, they've both had dreams and they don't know how to answer these dreams. And Joseph then goes and he uh, seeks to interpret these dreams. And this is how Joseph describes um, the Uh, the uh, cupbearer being restored to his position. He says in Genesis 40 verse 13, within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position. The cupbearer was going to be reconciled to Pharaoh. He was going to be at peace with Pharaoh once more. He had done something to irk Pharaoh. He had gotten thrown into prison, but he was going to be brought out of prison again and his face would be turned towards Pharaoh and Pharaoh would look upon him and he would serve him once again. And that's God's face disposition towards us. God's face is lifted up and it's turned towards each one of us and he looks upon us. He's not turned away from us in anger. It's not hidden from us as if he's withdrawing. It's lifted up and turned and looking to us. That's what that phrase, the Lord lift up 
his countenance. It's that idea of him lifting up his face and turning it and directing it uh, to us. There's peace between us and God. And that peace has been accomplished by God's hand. Jesus, the Son of God, took our nature to accomplish this reconciliation. And Paul tells us, uh, or told the uh, the church in Colossae, that Jesus made peace through his blood shed on the cross. And so that means that those of us who were outside of Christ have now, or not at peace with God, have been brought to peace with God through Christ's death. And then, as we've repented of our sins, trusted in Christ, God's face is turned towards us. And peace with God, it translates into God's peace ruling our hearts. He gives it to us as a gift. It's one of those spiritual blessings that we enjoy. That we, we, I, I mentioned that we have all these spiritual blessings at the beginning in our first psalm. And the Holy Spirit, he plants this peace in our hearts and he nurtures its growth in our lives. So that then we'll have it to an ever increasing uh, degree. And we enjoy God's peace throughout our lives. Many things in life challenge God's peace. We worry about family. We feel stressed in work. We carry concerns about our health. We can go on and we could talk about the concerns that we have for those in our community friends and the trajectory of life that they're under. The list is endless as to the things that disturb peace. Let's not forget what Jesus said to his fearful followers. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And then Isaiah, he testifies to God's peace as well. He says, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. That's a great problem with our world, isn't it? That she doesn't look for peace in the right place. And so she doesn't enjoy peace. And so there's rarely a circumstance of life where we don't need peace. We need peace in the unknown of life. When things are uncertain, we need peace. When life's disrupted, we need peace. As difficulties arise, we need peace. When we face conflict, we need peace. When there is upheaval, we need peace. And so as you look at the week ahead, what is it that causes you to worry? What is it that unsettles you? Where do you need God's peace? Well, remember God's last word to you. I will give you my peace. The time's up. Worship is coming to a close here this evening. We're about to leave God's immediate presence as the people of God. We're going to walk down that tunnel, out through that door into the arena of life for the next week. God's final word to us as we leave worship each week, as the benediction is pronounced, is I will keep you. I will sustain you by my grace and I will grant you my peace. Amen.